Okay, so um, I want to say a few words, first of all, to set the context for what I'm going to talk about. I'm involved in a research study, and many of you here, I think, will probably have responded to a survey that has been sent out in the last couple of months. Um, and I want to thank you most graciously for participating and encourage more people to participate. But before I talk about the actual survey, I want to say a few things just to provide a context or background. My first job in psychology uh, was on a CE scheme. You know, it was FOSS in those days. Um, and 32 pounds a week, 1987. And my job was to collate data that had been gathered as part of a primary school's assessment service. It was a uh, learning disability service, the Daughters of Charity in Dublin. And they had been um, doing a lot of primary school assessments in the absence of community services. So a lot of screening, um, a lot of ch the referrals were coming from primary schools. And my job was to, to go come in and actually try and make some sense of this data. And I remember feeling, I was, you know, I was young, I didn't have children myself, I wasn't that connected with primary schools. And I remember looking at the data and feeling completely overwhelmed. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, because of course the range and diversity and extent of need that I saw in this, in this survey of schools um, and children that needed assessment was just so vast, I, I just kind of felt, how could you possibly meet all these needs? Fast forward a few years, my first job as a clinical psychologist, I was working in Roscommon in community care. And I remember, uh, just like I remember in the, in the previous job, I remember the desk, and I remember arriving into my office in a nice, clean, tidy office. Didn't stay that way for long. But I remember this, the, the clear desk and a big bundle of pages, paper, sitting on the desk with a new pen and a new pad beside it and a brown buff folder. And I thought, well, what's this? You know, somebody got my room ready for me in my nice new job. And I opened up the folder and it was the waiting list. And there was 173 children on my waiting list. I hadn't been a psychologist there for two years. And I remember sitting and looking through the referral forms, and I remember that feeling of being overwhelmed because um, you don't, as, as many of you will remember, you don't come out newly qualified, full of, you know, um, I can you know, conquer the world. You come out full of trepidation, thinking somebody's going to find me out, somebody's going to discover that I actually haven't a clue what I'm doing here, and somebody let me in and then don't realize it. Um, and I remember reading through those referrals and the, again the range of needs and the extent of needs and children who had been referred maybe two years beforehand, 18 months, who had now actually gone on to secondary school. So they were no longer going to come in under my remit in terms of um, sending out appointments. So I, the reason I'm talking about that is when I looked at the survey responses uh, of the survey that I'm going to talk about. And I was reading through the comments the principals made on, in, the, in the text boxes, and I, I really want to say thank you, because of course, when people make extra comments in surveys, it's so worthwhile to read through them. You get such rich information. And I was reading through them, and again, I was struck by that feeling of being overwhelmed and thinking, oh my goodness, um, the kind of extent of difficulties that schools are dealing with the range and how, how, t how schools are actually managing and, and are managing, um, and I think it's important to say that, and, and are able to draw on a range of resources, but again, I think that kind of feeling quite overwhelmed by it all. So I want to kind of put that out there and park it for the moment, um, because I'll come back to it. Okay, so what do we know from the research in terms of emotional well-being? Um, and this is all material that you're all very familiar with. So we know that there's a really strong connection between emotional well-being and educational attainment, social functioning, uh, the risk of developing mental health difficulties in adulthood, early school leaving, young people dropping out of school because of emotional difficulties, um, and then participation and attitudes in school, and, and strong correlations between emotional well-being and all of those factors. We also know very well that early intervention is where it's at both intervening early in a person's life and also intervening early in the stage of developing difficulties. It's more economically efficient, it's much more economically inefficient to try to intervene later when difficulties are much more entrenched. And it's more effective. 
um, a recent evaluation of the Zippy's Friends program talked about that the, the effective age to intervene is between two and seven, and that actually after the age of eight, um, it's, it's much more ineffective. Um, we also know from uh, the Eructus Spotlight Report in 2012, and even going back to the WHO Charter in 1986, the importance of school as a setting for promoting mental health. Um, so this, this brings me to um, an interest that we have in DCU and the research team, myself with my colleague Dr. Evelyn Gordon and Deirdre Dooley Judge. Um, and we're interested in looking at the national landscape at the moment and seeing, well, what is actually happening out there? What kind of needs are children presenting with to primary schools? And what is being done? What resources are schools able to draw on in terms of responding to those children's needs? Um, we looked at the international literature on school-based counselling services to see, well, what, what's happening outside of Ireland? And what we discovered, thankfully, a lot of the work has been done. The British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy published a report in 2013, and they did an international scoping study to see what, um, what countries had mandatory school-based counselling services and to what stage had, had countries developed school-based services. And what we found that was that, what they found was that there's, in 39 countries, there are mandatory school-based counselling services. So there's actually legislation underpinning the provision of counselling in primary schools that's situated in the schools. Um, and in, uh, for up to 60 countries, the services are very well developed. Um, so the services are there, they just, just may not have a legislative footing. So they took a closer look at that um, to see, well, who's providing these services? And what they found was that it's mostly teachers who have done additional training, kind of a dual training um, in teaching and also in either counselling or psychology. But that the counselling role and the counsellor in the school is an integral part of the school system. And they're involved in a range of activities with children that includes a lot of prevention work as well as actually one-to-one uh, -one counselling. The BACP then, the following year, published a report on the UK, and they looked in a little bit more detail in terms of the school counselling services that are provided in the UK. I think the UK had, um, I think in 2007 or something, they got a really, you know, black mark against them in terms of um, emotional well-being in schools, a UNICEF report. And by 2012, there was over 50% of schools had school-based counselling services. So there was a big drive in those years to actually up their game and provide more services directly in schools. So they took a look and see, well, what, what are, what's the nature of the counselling that's provided in these schools? And what they found were um, that in terms of presenting difficulties, the most, uh, the most prominent difficulty that was being presented to schools was family problems. Um, that was followed by trauma and abuse, and at the same level, friendships and bullying. And that was followed by bereavement and then anxiety. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a little while, but that's, it's interesting to have that kind of information from our neighbouring country in terms of the kinds of difficulties that children are presenting with. What they found was that in terms of counselling, individual counselling sessions provided, that it, was, it worked out at about an average of 15 sessions per child. It was a, a very wide range, as you can imagine. Um, and in terms of the media that was used, predominantly uh, play-informed work, um, followed by art, storytelling, psychoeducational work, music and drama. And it was mostly humanistic uh, type work. So I, I found that interesting, that the basis of the interventions was more from a humanistic. And people are familiar with Carl Rogers and um, a humanistic psychotherapy is very much based on trying to create the right environment. So the role of the counsellor in that context is to create the right conditions and allow the child the space and the trust um, and the safety to be able to explore whatever it is they need to talk about. Um, so what the research that has been done on school-based counselling services in terms of looking at, well, does it actually make any difference? Um, what, what kind of improvements are there? So what they found was improvements in emotional difficulties, and this is drawing on a range of studies, uh, improvements in behaviour and mood, uh, improvements in problem, in social, problem solving in social settings, and improvements in the school ethos. Now, I want to say a word about the problem solving in the social settings because I think it's interesting. Um, 
Some of the research that I'm familiar with in terms of young people at risk of suicide and resilience uh, research, looking to see what promotes resilience in young people. And of course, one of the issues is problem solving capacity. Um, and I think when I was mentioning earlier about that feeling of, of being overwhelmed, what happens when you're overwhelmed or when you're um, very emotional, whether that be low mood or anxious or whatever, is that the part of our brain, the frontal lobe, doesn't work so well. Um, and we actually lose our ability to think clearly, we lose our ability to plan, we lose our ability to be, to be able to see beyond how we're feeling right now. So our problem-solving capacities are really impacted when we're feeling very emotional. And obviously when children are struggling with a lot of emotional difficulties, they're not quite able to access those internal resources that they might normally be able to access when they're not feeling quite so bad. So I think that's a very important um, thing for us to think about is how can we promote and enhance children's problem-solving capacities by addressing the emotional well-being issues. Okay, um, so on that I want to move on to uh, some of, I just want to share with you some of what we've, we've discovered from the survey. I, I deliberately didn't um, rep kind of analyze in terms of percentages of responses or whatever because the survey is still live and, and the uh, responses are still coming in. So I didn't want to be premature in terms of actually putting figures, but I did want to give you a flavor of what we're beginning to see. So one of the questions that we had was, what types of difficulties are children presenting with in schools? Top of the list family issues, not surprisingly. And of course, in the UK study, the top of the list was family issues as well. So I suppose this gives us a sense that there's a lot of families out there struggling. And of course, those struggles are finding them with their way into the school and, and children um, struggling with them. And I was really struck by when I was thinking about this um, in my last job in DIT and training social care workers, um, I would ring up uh, family support services looking for placements for my students and in the last year that I was there which would have been 2011 2012 the number of times that I rang a service asking if they would be able to take a student this year as they had done in previous years and the response that I got was would love to take a student no problem if we're still here so of course I was ringing only a few months in advance so perhaps I was starting making my phone calls in September with a view to a placement starting in January and I was kind of thinking, how, how can you work in a setting providing this kind of services to families and you don't even know if you're going to be there in a couple of months' time? So that, that has been a, a kind of a dominant feature in family support services in the last number of years where it's so uncertain. And, and you know, I suppose my wonder, my question is, what's happening then? In the absence of those family support services, are children bringing these difficulties into the school setting and schools end up um, trying to support them? The second most prominent issue was separation, divorce, and marital breakdown. And the, these are the terms that we used. So we had a checklist asking people to um, endorse items. Um, I was surprised at that being so high on the list. Um, and, and, you know, I suppose that's something that we need to think about in terms of supporting children through these very difficult experiences. And I'm, I'm just as with the family issues, I'm really conscious that. You know, family issues means the families are struggling and the families are not able to support or perhaps um, navigate their children's way through these issues. And similarly with marital breakdown, you know, the couple, the parents, um, the couple that's breaking down, they're clearly going through a very difficult time. And it's a very difficult time to be able to support your children through and to be able to support them through it in the right way. Anxiety, number three. Um, and of course, we know from international research that uh, the prevalence of anxiety disorders in children is very high. One study found it up to as high as 21%. Um, someone who did an overview of studies suggests it's probably typically around 10%. And that's anxiety disorder, so that's at the very extreme end of the spectrum. And of course, we all know children present um, all the time with different kinds of anxiety and it's very much a part of normal childhood development to have different kinds of anxieties. But I was, I was teaching this week a, a psychology students class and I, I gave them an anxiety test to, to fill out to show them just you know an example of how we assess anxiety in adults and it was a self-administered um, questionnaire. 
So of course I went round them in small groups to see how they were getting on with filling out their questionnaire and some of them were saying, this is very high, you know, I scored very high on this and I don't regard myself as an anxious person, like is, is it normal to be anxious? Um, and of course, it, it is very much part of normal human experience to feel anxiety. It's just about how high your levels are and how much anxiety you can cope with. Because we all, just, just like we all um, respond differently to different situations, we have different psychological resources to be able to deal with anxiety-provoking situations. So we're all different. Um, what we need to know for ourselves and for children around us is what's too much? What's, what, what, at what point does it become um, too much for them to be able to cope with on their own and they actually need help. I was surprised again at this one being so high, anger. And I was, I've thought about this one a lot in the last few days because one of the things that strikes me is I, I've uh, just recently published a book on talking with children about difficult topics. And I suppose the really strong message in the book is that we need to create an environment for children to be able to talk about their feelings and to talk about what's going on in their lives. And I suppose as a society, you know, we've done an awful lot about trying to help children express themselves and um, express their emotions and talk about what's going on for them. But I'm also, I've done some training in a, in a kind of a, a, an area of psychotherapy, emotion-focused therapy, um, and I'm doing some teaching tomorrow and I was looking over the stuff last night and I was thinking about this anger and, and the level of anger that children are presenting with. And I was thinking, okay, yes, of course it's, it's, it's important for children to be able to express their feelings and to be able to talk about it. But it's just as, if not more important, for, the, for them to be able to be taught how to regulate their emotions. And of course, you don't teach someone to regulate their emotions by telling them how to do it. Uh, certainly as a parent, you, you, you're a role model. You do it by managing your emotions yourself. So how children in families learn about emotion regulation is by witnessing and experiencing their parents, both regulating their own emotions and regulating their children's emotions from a very early age. So I was thinking about the connection between this and the first issue about family issues. And, uh, and, and I was thinking about families struggling with on the one hand, perhaps we're all encouraging children to talk about their feelings and express their feelings, but maybe they're doing it, and of course they're not able to contain them then. They're not able to regulate the emotions, and perhaps we need to put a bit more energy into helping people manage and regulate their own emotions so that then we can help our children. Bereavement was the next issue, um, and of course, you know, there are lots of resources out there in terms of bereavement and helping children through these kind of experiences. And of course, it is very much a normal part of human life that we all lose people. It's the one thing we can depend on is that someone that we love, someone close to us, will die at some point. I was struck by a number of the comments of principals describing suicides. So a lot of children having to cope with the aftermath of a parent, um, a, a relative, a friend, um, teachers dying, uh, so, you know, ver very challenging, I suppose, in terms of the, the normal bereavements that we all experience, but um, something um, much more significant than that. Um, bullying and cyberbullying, we, we had those as two separate points, but if you put them together, they uh, very much come in, and I'm sure that's no surprise to people. We did also ask people about how they deal with critical incidents and what kind of critical incidents they may have experienced in the previous year um, and the resources that they drew on in terms of coping with that. So a lot of principals mentioned NEPS as, as a resource and also the critical incident policy. But the other kind of resources that they talked about was sometimes just ourselves, um, looking up inter uh, internet resources, um, staff in the school who had got an additional training, etc. Just wanted to give you a flavour of a quote from um, a principal in terms of accessing help. So I talked to the NEP psychologist and seek her advice. Usually there's a requirement for further steps to be taken for that child that might include a referral to another body such as CAMS, etc. But I feel that this is inadequate as the child then has to wait too long for an assessment. Having said this, the assessment is just that, an assessment, and there's no therapeutic intervention meantime to help the child. The system that we have in place in the primary sector is inadequate to meet the ongoing needs of the children. I've referred children to play therapists with good outcomes, as I feel that this has made an impact on their general behaviour in the school. 
I've arranged for group therapy in the school setting for children with anxiety issues, and I've had good results that would not have been achieved otherwise. So one of the things that we're interested in is trying to capture, you know, what is it the schools are doing? How are they accessing resources? And what kind of resources are there around the country so that we can develop a, a, a good evidence base or a research base um, for what we know is actually happening out there? So the range of supports that people talked about are range from the rainbows programs, various kind of programs that are incorporated into the school curriculum through to uh, school completion projects, NEPs, primary care psychology, CAMs, and private counsellors and therapists. And just as we suspected, this, the scenario was quite ad hoc. You know, some schools seem to have lots of resources and some schools re really struggle with accessing resources. So the plan that we have in our research study is want to encourage more principals to complete the survey so that we can get as much information as we can. And we're also interested in conducting interviews with interested principals, counsellors or therapists who do work in primary schools and also the other key stakeholders. So for instance, NEPs and other agencies that interlink with school. So that is my presentation. I want to say Gurmahagov, and I really look forward to be able to engage today and, and contribute in whatever way I can to this collaboration to try and develop a, uh, an implementation plan or some kind of um, concrete plan to move forward. Thank you.